In the last few videos, we spent quite some time on theory development and I think to recover from all the technical details, we should now do some concrete applications and calculations which come out of those theorems. So, first of all, let me recall a result we already know, namely the homology computation of real projective space. So, in this video, let's, let's just agree that Hn denotes singular homology and then the nth homology of the d-dimensional real projective space with coefficients in the integers that has three possible outcomes. There is a z summand in degree zero because it's of course a path connected space and there might be another z summand in degree the dimension of the real projective space but only if this dimension is odd. And in addition to that, we have a couple of Z mod 2 summons in the middle degree, so in the middle degrees between 0 and n, um, but they are also only at the odd degrees. So we have a Z mod 2 term for every n between 0 and d, whenever n is odd. And finally, in all other cases, in all other degrees, the homology is trivial. Okay, and now we learned the method um, to compute homology with coefficients in a different module out of, the, out of knowledge of the homology modules with coefficients in the integers. And let's do this now um, for the choice of Z mod 2 as our new coefficient module. So to do so, there are two ingredients in the universal coefficient theorems, theorem which need to be computed. So first of all, it's the tensor product of the old, so of the integral homology with the new coefficient module, Z mod 2. That's one thing we need to compute. And the other thing is this Tor term on the right-hand side of the universal coefficient theorem of this exact sequence. And since we then know that the sequence splits, it actually, um, everything is done, then we know that the new homology with coefficients in Z mod 2 will be the direct sum of these two results. So let's first of all do the tensor product, the left-hand side. So let's compute the nth homology of RPD with coefficients in Z. And now after first taken homology, we take the tensor product over Z with Z mod 2. And let's see what we get out of this. So this term here has three possible summons. Of course, whenever the module is um, zero, so when this term is zero, then the tensor product will also be zero. So the only interesting thing is um, the Z summons or the Z modules and the Z mod two modules. And uh, we already know by, or we already derived those general property properties of tensor products, which tells us that if we take the tensor product over Z with Z here, then we just get um, Z mod two, the unchanged module on the other side. So these Z um, um, homology modules just turn into Z mod 2 modules here. And in addition, whenever we have a Z mod 2 term here on the left hand side, so if the degree is such that this homology is Z mod 2, then we also know what to do with this tensor product, namely the tensor product of Z mod 2 and Z mod 2. That's Z mod, the greatest common divisor of those two numbers which are divided out here, but the greatest common divisor, the divisor of 2 and 2 is of course 2. So these terms also give us um, Z mod 2 terms. So in other words, we only get Z mod 2 as non-zero item and this occurs now if n is zero or in these um, degrees where we had originally also a Z mod 2 term. Um, right, and now, well, I just wanted to write it like this, so the same inequality as up here, but now if d is odd, then we can also get um, a z mod 2 term for n equals d, so let me write the less or equal sign here and uh, assume in addition that d must be odd, then we have all cases covered. So and not. All right, and in all other cases, it's zero. So, so much for the tensor product part of the universal coefficient theorem. The second thing we need to compute is this Tor term on the right-hand side of the short exact sequence. So it's Tor 1 over Z. Now, 
remember, we always have to include this dimension shift here. So this is the n minus first homology, which is relevant here of RPD with coefficients in C. And the second argument of the Tor functor that is um, just our coefficient module, our new one, Z mod two. And here we also learned um, how to compute Tor functors for a given input data. And uh, well, again, three possible um, modules will be inserted on the left here. Either it's a free module, let's just like this Z term here, but then we know by general properties of the Tor functor that it just vanishes. So these Z summons will give no Tor term. And uh, the ones that do give some data is the Z mod two. If we take a Z mod two module on the left hand side here, then the property of the Tor functor for principal ideal domains like Z is sort of the same thing we already did for the tensor product. Then the Tor functor of Z mod something, comma Z mod something will be Z mod the greatest common divisor of those two somethings, which in this case is just two. So in other words, we'll get a Z mod two Tor term in these cases. And so let's see, Z mod two occurs whenever we had a Z mod two here. So this was in case zero is less than N is less than D. But now remember we have the dimension shift. So we have to put N minus one here in the middle of these inequalities. And then, well, these I can write down these inequalities equivalently by adding one in all three terms as one is smaller than n is smaller than d plus one. And now the additional requirement is that n is odd here, but of course this now means that n minus one must be odd. So the correct condition is that n must be even here. And if I have an inequality, a strict inequality of integers here, then I can get the equivalent condition if I just put less or equal here, and instead of that, I delete the plus one here. So this is a more efficient way of writing down the same thing. And like I said, in all other cases, whenever I insert a projective or even a free module or the zero module, then I get zero as torture. Okay. And now this is all the information we needed to collect to use our universal coefficient theorem now to conclude the homology of real projective space with coefficients in Z mod two. Namely, we obtain the following result by UCT. We have HN of RPD with coefficients in C mod two. That is the following. So the tensor product term contributes a Z mod two module in all degrees between zero and D where N is odd. And the Tor part of the universal coefficient theorem contributes a Z mod two term in all degrees between one and D where N is even but since here also zero is included, this actually just means that we have a Z mod two module in all degrees between zero and D, including um, zero and D. So the result is we get Z mod two for zero less or equal N, less or equal T, D, and zero otherwise. Okay, so one should view this calculation more or less like as, an, as a reality check because we already knew before that um, this is what comes out if you compute the homology with the Zimmer two coefficients of RPD. And probably the better or more efficient way to calculate this homology is actually to do it by the cellular method. Yeah? So to know that um, RPD has a natural CW structure consisting of one cell in each degree and the gluing maps are such that in the cellular chain complex, all boundary maps will just be multiplication by two. So the incidence numbers will all be two. But for the ring Z mod two, what, comes, what, what happens then is that these um, boundary morphisms are all zero. Because multiplication by two is zero in this um, ring here. And therefore we just get uh, as homology the same thing as the chain complex, which is just one Z mod two module corresponding to each cell. So this yeah, that's, that's maybe a general rule that if you know the CW complex and its cellular homology well, it's better to use that approach. 
Yes. But sometimes you have computed the homology of a space from some other source without knowing or without even specifying a CW structure and then mm -hmm. it's very useful to have this UCT theorem. Yeah. So much for an application of the universal coefficient theorem. Let's now also consider an application of the second big theorem that we just proved, namely the Kunert formula. So to give an example computation there, let me first of all derive a general result which follows from the Kunert formula and then we will use this result to conclude a concrete calculation out of this. And the general result is the following. So for any topological space X, We can say what the homology is of x times the d-dimensional sphere. And to formulate the result, let's just again fix that h star is supposed to denote singular homology with coefficients in z. And then we have that the n's homology of x times the d-sphere is isomorphic to the nth homology of x plus the n minus d homology of x. Yeah. So what this says actually in particular is if I consider the functor h n blank times s d then this gives me again a homology theory. Yeah. Not an ordinary one because I have now um, the point has now homology in different degrees also but it's um, a direct sum of homology theories and therefore it's itself a homology theory. Okay, so let's prove this. Of course, we want to prove this formula by using the Kunert formula. So first of all, to apply the Kunert formula, we need to know what the homology of the two factors here are and the homology of the sphere is of course well known by now. The nth homology of the d-sphere is z if n is equal to 0 or to d and it's 0 in all other cases. Okay. And the second thing one needs to know about to apply the Kunert formula are the tor terms of the corresponding two homology groups from x of x and of sd and this is no easy to state so it's the first tor, tor term that's of important here and in the formula there appears the p-th homology of the left-hand factor and the q-th homology of the right-hand factor. And now we see that in the right variable we enter the homology of the d-sphere but we see here that this module is either trivial or a free module, in particular projective module and for the tor functor we already um, saw that it vanishes whenever one of the arguments is projective. So therefore the easiest possible thing happens here and the tor term is just zero throughout for all p and q. And therefore our Kunert short exact sequence actually only gives us an isomorphism and says that the homology of the product of x and sd is the direct sum of um, the tensor product of homology groups for all partitions of n into two integ integers. So in formulas this means now we have an isomorphism from the direct sum p plus q equal to n and here we consider the p homology of x tensor the q homology of the d sphere. And then the Kunert formula says this is actually isomorphic to the homology of the product that we're interested in. Okay, so what remains to be seen is what is this direct sum on the left hand side? And actually, again, these homology of the d-sphere is zero most of the time. The only case when this homology is not zero and therefore the tensor product might be not zero is if q equals zero or if q equals d. But by this relation q equals zero implies that p equals n and if q equals d that implies that p equals n minus d and therefore in this direct sum only two sums do not vanish and these are precisely the ones 
that we need and that we wanted. So this is actually isomorphic to H n when P is n x direct sum with H n minus D when P is n minus D of x. Yeah. And therefore we obtain such an isomorphism and it's actually even a natural isomorphism yeah, as part of the statement of the Kuhnet formula. Okay. So this formula is good to know and it can of course be applied to any product of spaces with um, spheres and maybe the most famous of such space spaces is the torus which is actually a product of circles so a product of a bunch of S1s and in particular the d-dimensional torus is a product of the d minus first dimensional torus and one more copy of S1 and this can of course now be used for an inductive argument to compute the homology of the torus and this is supposed to be our final corollary. Let me grab a pen that writes. So the corollary is now that the nth homology of the d-dimensional torus that's actually free, namely it's z to the d choose n. Okay, and the proof, like I said, is an easy induction. Namely, we write Hn of Td as Hn of Td minus 1, let's delete the point here, times S1. And now we apply the formula that we just proved. Namely, this is the same as the Enthomology of Td minus 1, direct sum with the n minus um, first homology. Remember, it's now the dimension of the right hand sphere here that matters, so the n minus first homology of Td minus t to the d minus 1. And now, of course, like I said, the argument is an induction, and we do the induction over the dimension d, and since we now have to compute the homology of a d minus one dimensional torus. Here we are already allowed to use our induction hypothesis and use the formula we want to prove. So by induction over d, this is actually isomorphic to z to the, and here it's d minus one choose n, and here it's uh, d minus 1 choose n minus 1. And of course, if you take the direct sum of two free modules, then the ranks just add. So this is the same as z to the d minus 1 choose n plus d minus 1 choose n minus 1. And now you either know about the recursion formula for binomial coefficients, or you make a quick combinatorial argument to see that this actually gives you what you want. Namely, this is isomorphic to z to the d choose n. So let me remind you why. So d choose n is the number of possibilities to choose n apples from a row of, say, d apples, right? And if you want to count those possibilities, you can first of all restrict yourself and say, okay, let me, let's say we, I just choose n apples from among the first d minus 1 apples. Yeah, this is one possible choice, or this is one possible way of choosing n apples from d apples. And the possible options that you exclude by this case are just those choices where you do choose the last apple. But if you do choose the last apple, yeah, then you need, still need to choose n minus 1 apples among the first d minus 1 apples. And together, these two possibilities exhaust all possible um, possibilities to choose n apples from d apples. So therefore, this sum is actually precisely d choose n. And this proves uh, our formula and ends the proof of this corollary.